Hey, yeah, cryptozens. Welcome back to the Crypto Overnighter. My name is Nicodemus, and we do crypto news analysis nightly at 10 p.m. And keep in mind, none of this should be considered financial advice. And it's Wednesday, February 22nd, 2023. And how's your week so far? The staking services that Coinbase offers are different from those of Kraken, at least according to Coinbase's head lawyer, Paul Grewal. He said that the two exchanges offer fundamentally different staking services. Now, this was during a QA session on Coinbase's Q4 results, and he responded to a shareholder's question regarding the exchange's staking services. And he explained that Coinbase's staking products are very different from those yield products which were described in the regulatory action against Kraken. Grewal emphasized the differences between the two and that they matter. Now, he noted that Coinbase users maintain their ownership over their crypto, never leaves their possession. And according to Coinbase's user agreement, the exchange facilitates staking on users' behalf, but does not replace lost Ether due to slashing. Now, slashing is that mechanism that reduces a validator's tokens as a penalty for bad behavior on the blockchain. Now, another difference is that Coinbase's customers have a right to return on their staked assets, and the exchange does not get to decide whether they're going to pay any returns or not. Now, Grewal also highlighted Coinbase's registration as a publicly traded company, and that provides customers with transparent insight into the company's financials. In contrast, the Security Exchange Commission's complaint against Kraken alleged that users lost control of their tokens by offering them to Kraken's staking program. According to the SEC, Kraken reportedly offered investors outsized returns not tethered to any economic realities. And their arrangement meant the exchange could choose to pay no returns at all. Now, Grewal reiterated the need for regulatory clarity on staking services in the U.S. He pointed out that the SEC is outlining its expectations through court complaints rather than clear regulations. He argued that rules clearly distinguishing staking services would provide much needed clarity and the public should not have to decipher court complaints to understand regulatory expectations. In a tweet on February 13th, he expressed the view that staking does not constitute a security transaction. Following SEC Chair Gary Gensler's call for product registration, he stated that Coinbase has no objections to registering products with the SEC where appropriate, but as we all know, the path to registration for securities products and services has not been readily or easily accessible at present. Come in and talk to us, Gary says, and then he hits you with a fine for your trouble. If they offered some level of amnesty, you know, as long as you came in rather than when you were brought in, then that would be different. It wouldn't be perfect, but it would be different and it would be better. Now, Coinbase is under SEC investigation for its products, which are similar to Kraken's. And that ended up with Kraken settling with the regulator for $30 million. That's in addition to being prohibited from offering staking services to U.S. clients. Now, despite this, or maybe because of it, Coinbase's CEO and co-founder Brian Armstrong has indicated that the company intends to challenge the regulator and take the matter to court. Caitlin Long is the CEO of Custodia Bank, and she claims that factions in the Biden administration and in the U.S. Federal Reserve have thwarted their efforts to obtain a master account from the central bank. Now, I like that word, thwarted. Now, she didn't name them, but she stated that cryptocurrency is here to stay and that certain regulators will just have to address it. Long made these comments during an interview with CoinTV's First Mover program on Tuesday. She said that the regulators who are against cryptocurrency are just going to have to deal with it. She believes that if regulators think crypto will disappear or not return to the traditional U.S. banking system, they will be playing whack-a-mole for years to come. Now, Long is known to advocate for crypto-friendly legislation in Wyoming. Well, she wrote a recent blog post. She related the story of when she warned federal regulators of a potential fraud involving a crypto company. Now, Long did not name the company, but she said she also warned regulators of a possible bank run. She said that her warnings seemed to have gone unnoticed by the regulators. She said that Custodia Bank has been working hard for two and a half years to educate bank regulators on the risks and benefits of crypto-related technologies. 
Custodia Bank is currently a special purpose depository institution in Wyoming. They have been trying to join the U.S. banking system, but have encountered resistance from the regulators. The central bank denied Custodia's request for Federal Reserve System membership in January due to concerns about the bank's safety and soundness. In addition, the Kansas City Fed, which oversees Wyoming, denied Custodia's application for a master account. Now, Long has raised concerns about the independence of the Federal Reserve from the White House and the independence of the Kansas City Reserve Bank from the Federal Reserve. Now, she believes that the denial of Custodia Bank's application shows a coordinated effort among those agencies. Long also questions whether crypto should be regulated and integrated into the financial system or kept outside of it. Now, Custodia Bank renewed its request for a master account on Friday. According to Long, the bank's experience could be the start of regulatory retaliation against the crypto industry. She pointed out that the SEC had recently taken action against other crypto companies like Kraken and like Paxos. Long also believes that regulatory action inside the industry could force crypto companies to seek funding from banks outside of the U.S., which would lead to continued regulatory challenges. And not just funding, services too. Now, Long believes that there needs to be transparency regarding the involvement of politicians with Custodia Bank, which isn't even operational yet. She questions why the bank was chosen as a sacrificial lamb to scatter the herd, suggesting that there may be underlying motives. So everything I've told you for the last six and a half minutes or so is bad enough. This is even crazier because the Illinois Senate has either lost their collective minds or they've decided that the laws of man exceed the laws of physics. Here's what I mean. The Illinois Senate has introduced a bill that is drawing sharp criticism from the crypto community. This bill proposes that blockchain miners and validators must do things that everyone in the know considers to be impossible. One of the proposed changes is reversing transactions if ordered to do so by a state court. On February 9th, Illinois Senator Robert Peters introduced the Senate bill in the Illinois legislature. This bill was first noticed by the community on February 19th when lawyer Drew Hinks tweeted about it. Now he's a partner at KNL Gates and is an adjunct professor at the NYU School of Law. The Digital Property Protection and Law Enforcement Act is the title of the bill. The bill proposes to authorize courts to change or cancel a blockchain transaction executed by a smart contract. The attorney general or a state's attorney must make a valid request in accordance with Illinois law. The proposed act would apply to any blockchain network that processes a blockchain transaction originating in Illinois, which sounds like a great way to run blockchain companies out of Illinois, which is a bit of a change for them. Anyway, according to Hinks, the Senate bill is the most unworkable state law he has ever seen related to blockchain and cryptocurrency. Hinks expressed some surprise at the reversal of Illinois' previous pro-innovation stance. The Senate bill proposes to fine blockchain miners and validators between five and $10,000 per day for failing to comply with court orders. Now, Hinks recognizes that the proposed bill by Senator Peters is impossible to implement by miners and validators. He expressed surprise that miners or validators would have zero defense if they operate on a network that they cannot comply with court orders. Which, again, if you cannot comply, they're still going to fine you. Which is a great way to chase innovation somewhere else, somewhere overseas. The proposed bill also requires individuals using smart contracts to include code in their smart contract to comply with court orders. The bill mandates the inclusion of smart contract code to enforce court orders regarding the smart contract. Now, this bill has been getting panned widely by the crypto community. On February 19th, crypto analyst Fubar took to Twitter to mock the idea that court-ordered transactions could be amended without needing the private key of the participants. I find the idea hilarious. Now, Gabriel Shapiro is a lawyer and general counsel at Delphi Labs. He tweeted to his followers explaining that the Senate bill would attempt to ban immutability on blockchains. Carla Reyes is an assistant professor at Southern Methodist University School of Law, and she tweeted on February 19th suggesting that lawmakers should only introduce bills if they understand how the technology works. While immutability is a common feature in blockchains and distributed ledgers, 
The Peter-sponsored bill notes that such networks lack an enforcement mechanism that can be accessed by the courts. As a result, enforcing legal rights in digital property can be prohibitively expensive, and the property rights may not be vindicated. According to the bill, most blockchain crimes go unpunished. The Senate bill noted that fraud and mistake would be the most common reasons why Illinois courts would order a blockchain transaction to be reversed. Additionally, the bill aims to assist users in recovering their assets if they lose their private keys. All of which, the entire bill demonstrates that Ms. Reyes is right. Politicians, lawmakers, policymakers, and regulators should only suggest rules or laws if they understand what they are attempting to regulate. If you don't understand how blockchain works, don't write laws about it. If you don't know what private keys are, keep your trap shut about using them. If the bill is passed, it will take effect 30 days after becoming law. Stablecoins figured in news out of Israel today. On Wednesday, the Bank of Israel released a set of principles to regulate stablecoins in the country. They are intended to guide the central bank in their supervisory activities. In November, the Ministry of Finance in Israel published guidelines for regulating digital assets. The central bank has now released its own set of proposed regulations to manage the risks associated with using stablecoins while still allowing their use and not just banning them outright. The goal is to ensure the safe use of stablecoins in Israel. The Bank of Israel's proposed regulations come as a result of the collapse of the algorithmic stablecoin TerraUSD last May. However, the recommendations only apply to stablecoins that are backed by collateral, not algorithms. The central bank said that while algorithmic stablecoins like TerraUSD are not widely used for payments, it suggested that it may ban them if they gain too much popularity in the future. The Bank of Israel's proposed regulations state that if algorithmic stablecoins become a common means of payment, issuers will still have to hold full collateral. The bank's proposal recommends that stablecoin issuers hold reserves equivalent to the amount of cryptocurrency in circulation, enough to cover all the liabilities to their coin holders. This requirement is pretty much in line with similar regulations proposed in other jurisdictions, such as Hong Kong, Europe, the UK, and Japan. Albeit, most of those places will not allow algorithmic stables. They also suggest splitting supervisory responsibilities among multiple regulators for more efficient oversight. The central bank recommends that stablecoin issuers must obtain licenses to operate in the country. It suggests that the Banking Supervision Department should license the issuers of the larger stablecoins that have, quote, systematic importance. That would leave the Capital Market Authority to supervise the others. The proposed regulations state that payment-focused stablecoins will be overseen by the payments system oversight function at the central bank. The proposed rules are open for public comment until March 15, 2023. After this period, the bank will review the feedback received, make any necessary changes to the regulations, and recommend legislation to the government. And Augustin Karstens shares their concerns. In fact, during a speech on Wednesday, the general manager at the Bank for International Settlements stated that the events of 2022 have raised, quote, serious doubts on the ability of stablecoins to function as money. Karstens explained that stablecoins do not benefit from the same regulatory requirements and protections as bank deposits. Now, he made this point during a speech at the Monetary Authority of Singapore, where he leads the Association of Central Banks from around the world. Now, remember what I've said before. The BIS is the central bank for central banks. Even before the collapse of Terra in May, regulators and lawmakers worldwide were already concerned about stablecoins. Now, we were just talking the other night about that global standard setters have issued warnings that many existing stablecoins may not meet the rigorous standards that they have planned for the issuers. Karstens has expressed his concerns about stablecoins in the past particularly the possibility of shifting power over monetary systems away from central banks to profit-driven private entities. And he made sure to praise tokenized deposits and central bank digital currencies. Karstens added that there is an important lesson to learn from stablecoins from a public policy standpoint. He stated that stablecoins were created, in part, due to certain technological capabilities that are currently unavailable with existing forms of money. Now, according to Karstens, the central banks must engage with new technologies and innovate, because otherwise, the private sector will. 
in 2021, the BIS urged central banks globally to begin exploring national digital currencies. That message was heard, and now over 100 jurisdictions are contemplating whether to issue digital versions of their sovereign currency. And finally, a bit of hope against the overreach in the U.S. government. Representative Tom Emmer from Minnesota has proposed a bill. This bill may end up restricting the Federal Reserve's ability to create a central bank digital currency. On February 22nd, Emmer made an announcement about a new bill that he introduced. It's called the CBDC Anti-Surveillance State Act. Emmer wants to safeguard the financial privacy rights of Americans through this bill. The legislation would prevent the Federal Reserve from directly issuing a digital dollar to anyone. It may also prevent the central bank from issuing a CBDC to execute monetary policy. Additionally, any projects related to a digital dollar would need to be transparent, at least if this bill is passed. According to Emmer, any digital dollar must follow American values. He believes that privacy, individual sovereignty, and free market competition are important. If these values are not respected, the digital dollar could become a dangerous surveillance tool. The bill needs to pass in the House and the Senate, and President Biden needs to sign it into law for it to take effect, which would be a heck of a trick in today's political climate. If it does become law, the Federal Reserve Act would be modified. This would mean the limit of the central bank's control over CBDCs. Several people on social media have praised the bill, and personally, I see it as a positive move. Now, some of the supporters mentioned that they are in favor of the legislation because it could help safeguard financial privacy. This is not the first time Emmer has tried this. Last time was in January of 2022. Now, back then, Emmer referred to China's digital authoritarianism as his reason to want to limit the Federal Reserve's control over a digital dollar. For some time now, Emmer has been seen as a lawmaker who is supportive of crypto. He has urged the government to reduce regulations in order to encourage innovation in the industry. In December, Emmer asked Chair Gensler to attend a congressional hearing so he could, quote, answer questions about the cost of his regulatory failures. And that's going to do it for us tonight. I want to thank you, my listeners, because when you stop listening, I will stop talking. If you enjoyed tonight's show, then please like, follow, subscribe. Leave a message or a review. And in the meantime, we'll see you tomorrow night.